It's time for Supply Chain Now, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back. To the show on today's episode we're continuing our logistics with purpose series here powered by our great friends over at vector global logistics on this series we spotlight leaders and organizations that are on a noble mission and they're changing the world in one way shape or form so stay tuned as we look to increase your supply chain leadership iq on a quick programming note right here before we get started if you enjoyed today's conversation be sure to find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. All right, so I want to welcome in my fearless co-hosts here today on today's show. We've got the whole gang, or most of the whole gang, Enrique Alvarez, Managing Director of Vector Global Logistics. Enrique, good morning. Good morning, Scott. Great having, uh, great being here with you guys. Absolutely. We've had a string of outstanding interviews by folks doing really special things in the, the global uh, business world, and, and I think we're going to continue that string here today. Um, Enrique, joining us is your colleague Adrian Pertil, Business Development uh, and Strategic Accounts from Vector Global Logistics. Adrian, how you doing? Good morning, Scott. So doing well, thank you. Great to be a part of this again. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I miss our lunches back at King Plow, but we'll be back there soon enough, right? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so, too. I hope so, too. All right. So we've got a great featured guest today, as we've mentioned earlier. I want to welcome in Dr. Patrick Plonsky, Executive Director with Books for Africa. Good morning, Pat. Hey, Scott. How are you doing? Glad to be on your show. Well, I heard we're doing great, uh, all things considered. Heard a lot about you and your organization from the Vector team and looking forward to diving into your story here today. Yeah, thank you. Looking forward to having a good conversation. Definitely. Well, so before we talk shop and before we talk about all the, the, the neat things that Books for Africa is up to, let's get to know you a little better. So tell us about yourself, Patrick, you know, kind of where you're from, maybe an anecdote or two from your upbringing, you name it. Well, yeah, thank you. I was born on a farm in uh, outside of the Twin Cities in Minnesota and still live uh, and work at Books for Africa. Just a uh, you know, about an hour away from that farm. So I, I love Minnesota. Uh, I, I had a lot of fun growing up on that farm, but the thing about a farm is you're, you're sort of remote. And I was always a great student of, of history and um, world affairs. And so I always wanted to travel and go somewhere. And I remember as a, out there on the farm on some, some of the hot summer af afternoons in the summer we'd be out hoeing uh, weeds out of the bean field mm. and I'd see these planes flying over and uh, and I'd be there hoeing and I'd look up and I'd say you know I bet those people are going somewhere I want to go somewhere <laughs> <laughs> you know that's so funny you mentioned that uh, here you know we live in the Atlanta area and and so we see uh, planes all the time and I can't can't help but thinking when I'm at a uh, one of my kids' soccer games or baseball games, and you see one of those planes going, you, you can't help but wonder where they're headed to, what adventure is next, you know? Um, but I want to ask you, Pat, going back to your Minnesota roots and, and your love for the state, are, are you a big baseball fan, a big Twins fan? I am. I Back when they used to have transistor radios out on the farm and the Twins were horrible, I would listen religiously and uh, listen to them uh, lose. They've gotten better now, and yes. so it's a lot more fun to, uh, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to, to watch the Twins and actually, you know, get to the stadium. It's a beautiful stadium, so uh, the, love, love the Twins. Great fan. Always have been. Well, your 1991 Twins absolutely broke my Atlanta Braves' heart. What a team you had that year, uh, led, of course, by Hall of Famer, the late Kirby Puckett. Uh, what a, uh, a great series that was. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, you know, interestingly, um, one of our supporters at Books for Africa is the son of Jackie Robinson, 
wow. who of all things mm. ended up traveling to Africa and he now lives in Tanzania as a coffee farmer. Well, we brought him back a few years back and uh, he threw off the first pitch at a Twins game, uh, you know, in uh, honoring the legacy of, of his father, Jackie Robinson. Spe incredibly special story and what a, what a great legacy that is. And, and for his son to be involved in, in, in initiatives like Books for Africa, it's gotta be uh, very rewarding. Well, um, before we, we turn it over and we bring Adrian in to talk about your professional journey, what else? So um, what is so special about living in Minnesota these days? Where do you find when you're not, you know, doing good and, and leading the organization you lead, where do you spend your free time? Well, um, you know, I, I love to travel and I love to come home and I just love the fact that Minnesota is such a, uh, you know, is an international place. Um, it's very livable community here, uh, but um, I, it's fun to travel, but I, I, and I look forward to it, but I always look forward to coming home. Uh, you know, just, I think, um, you know, the greenery, the trees, the parks, uh, Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, which is actually not accurate because there's actually some 20,000 lakes in Minnesota. Huh. So, uh, you know, the great American dream is to own your own house. The great Minnesota dream is to own your own cabin. So all Minnesotans uh, uh, worth their salt either own or get to a cabin uh, whenever they can, and that's up in the northern part of the state. So my family has a, a cabin now also, and so we, we really enjoy that among, among many other things. Love that. You know, I think the people are special up there. I've been to the Twin Cities a couple of times in my career and have always really enjoyed uh, the warmness and, and, and just the conversations you have and, and so much of the culture up there. All right, so uh, Adrian, I want to bring you back into the conversation. I know you're a bit curious about uh, Pat's professional background. Yeah, uh, Pat, tell us about your professional little journey and, and how that journey uh, actually helped to shape your world worldview. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. We, um, I, I went to a small liberal arts college in Minnesota, studied history, and uh, I always thought I was going to, you know, political science and history, I, I always thought I'd end up at an embassy working for the State Department or, um, you know, advise uh, the President of the United States at some point. So I always th thought that's where I'd be and that's where I wanted to be. But then what I found out is, um, that for those sorts of jobs, you you would sort of get sent where they wanted to send you. And I thought, well, you know, I like to travel, and and but I like to be able to pick the country and and decide when I'm coming and when I'm going. And so I I didn't like the constraints, um, as my wife would say, uh, you don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> so there, there's some truth to that. I do like to to sort of set my own course. But so I was looking for something international but also that would give me more control over my, my own destiny. And uh, I, I sort of started in politics. Uh, I, I thought I would just, uh, that would be a holding pattern. So my first real job was at the Minnesota House of Representatives. And I thought, well, that'll hold me and then I'll go to Washington. And it was such a good job. I, I stayed there 11 years. I was getting uh, resumes at our office from people in Washington who wanted my job and they were saying, you know, hey, I want to work for, you know, the Minnesota House of Representatives. I'm whatever, an intern in Washington. And I thought, well, gosh, if everybody wants this job, this must be a pretty good job. I should probably keep it. And so I did. And I was working with agriculture, the agriculture committee. And we actually traveled to Washington, D.C. a lot with the agriculture committee. So that was, uh, I, I found I was able to live in Minnesota, which I love, but also travel, which I also loved. So I spent a good bit of time meeting with members of Congress on the Agriculture Committee and, and uh, working on agricultural policy. If and I can ask you a quick question, Pat, on that note, um, what is one thing about politicians that the general public may not appreciate? What's one, what's one thing that you really enjoyed during, during those 11 years? The, the thing I liked about uh, politicians is they are very personable as a rule. They are people, people, people. You don't get elected if you don't like people. 
Mm. And so politics notwithstanding, you know, when you sit down and, and talk with elected officials, they're very personable. They, they, and they're very proud of where they come from. So they'll talk, you know, they'll, they'll love a particular uh, pizzeria or a particular restaurant or their sports team. And they've got a million stories and they're, and that's the thing is they're really fun people to talk to in their own right, politics notwithstanding. Well, it sounds like early on in, in, in your earlier career, you, you had a global element that a lot of folks would love to have. And, and, and did that really shape, as Adrian was asking about, your worldview and, and, and how you look at, at business and the economy? Well, when I was working for the legislature, I, I you know, the, the Minnesota House of Representatives, it was always, uh, I always was trying to get into the international uh, realm, and I was trying and trying, and I remember some people sort of scoffing at my efforts and saying, yeah, you keep talking about this, Pat, but, you know, you're, you're not international. You work here for the Minnesota House of Representatives, and, and I remember what ultimately happened is the job at Books for Africa came, I applied for it. I had, I had, was actually working at, switched to the Minnesota, uh, University of Minnesota. I was working again, agricultural education. And I managed to travel a bit. I'd get, you know, uh, a foundation funded um, project or something. And, and so I was, you know, in working on agricultural issues in Europe and in, you know, a little bit in Central America. And, uh, and so I applied for Books for Africa and lo and behold, they wanted to hire me. And I remember thinking, okay, this is it. You either take this job, <laughs> Pat, or stop talking about it because this is it. And I had, a, again, a good job at the University of Minnesota, but this was the great leap. And, um, you know, it was a small nonprofit at the time, Books for Africa. And there were risks, but in, in crisis is, op is opportunity, as is uh, often said. And so I thought, well, it's time to take a calculated risk, leave that safe, cushy job, and uh, real, really do the international things that I've been talking about and wanting to do for, for decades. Mm. Well, let's, so that, that's a great segue into talking more about Books for Africa. Um, so you made the leap, and, and you've been there for how long, Pat? 17 and a half years now. Wow, man. And gosh, so much has changed in the last seven years, much less the last 17 years. But let's make sure our audience knows what um, the mission is behind Books for Africa. So tell us more about what the organization does. Well, our mission is very simple. We are the world's largest shipper of books and computers to Africa. We so our mission is to send high quality books uh, to schools, libraries, universities across Africa. And, and that's how we measure success is numbers of books sent. Now, that being said, we don't want to send junk. We want to send good, high quality books that people, uh, our recipients in Africa, find useful. Uh, and so that's, that's the mission day in and day out. Every single shipment has a story behind it. So in, in some ways, everyone is unique, but in some ways, everyone is the same. It's, it's sending books to Africa. And so that's our, our core mission, and it has been our mission since day one, and we've grown it such that we are now the world's largest shipper of books to Africa. Mm. So tell us, I love how, I love simplicity, number one, and a simple mission is so, um, uh, so powerful. Uh, it, it, it's, it can be very unifying and, and just, um, you know, keeping everybody on the same page and, and protecting that alignment. Talk about, if you would, the impact. Um, you know, I think here in the States, we probably take for granted uh, the books we have at our disposal and the books that our kids have at their disposal and, and, and the impact that has on their development. Speak to the impact that the organization, that your organization is having in sharing that with African children. Yeah, I, I was once told by a newspaper editor, uh, pictures are good news. And I always remember that, and that's always true. Some organizations rely 
upon big thick reports, you know, showing that whatever literacy increased by 10% over five years or whatever it is. And I, I you know, as a, as a, I have a doctorate in education and I studied all that stuff, so I can recognize the benefit of that too. That sort of data on a continental level is really hard to come by. It's very expensive to get and uh, it, it's, it's hard to, to confirm. So we, we don't get a lot of data. What we do get is a lot of stories and we get pictures of recipients getting the books. We get testimonials uh, from uh, our recipients saying, you know, these books really were good and thank you so much and they're very helpful. So it's a lot of, of testimonials, it's a lot of stories, it's pictures, it's little short videos. and. Um, you know, the, the, in, the interesting thing about these books is we don't make anyone take our books. The recipients want these books, and they go through a, a lot of work to get them. And uh, our friends at Vector uh, can, you know, testify to a lot of the work that has to be done. And, and sometimes the recipient is a school teacher or something. They, they don't know international shipping. All they know is they want to get 20 tons of books to their community library and, 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 their, and distribute uh, maybe around 10 or 15 schools and libraries in that community. They don't know anything about international shipping. Uh, and so that's where we uh, have to make it really simple and uh, allow them to do what they want to do, which is to just get, get the books, distribute the books. And, uh, you know, we, I, I always say we wouldn't be around 31 years if, if, there were not a demand for mm. what we're doing and if we were not on the right track. So someone at USAID once told me, uh, Pat, never give up. You're on the right track. Never give up. Uh, she told me that after we had just been denied for funding. And I've been denied for a lot of funding. <laughs> <over the years. laughs> Many, you know, so there were plenty of opportunities over the years to give up. But I, I remember that. Here was a big funding person at USAID. They told us, you're not going to get the funding, but you're on the right track. Never give up. And uh, so we, we don't. Well, that, and I imagine uh, that that kind of goes to the territory. You, you're not going to you're not going to win every grant, every funding request. I mean, um, but to your point, you wouldn't be around 31 years if, if you weren't fulfilling a great and noble mission. Uh, and I love your going back to what you shared earlier, the quote you got uh, pictures are good news. That is there's so much truth in that on a wide variety of levels. And, and we all know we need more good news than ever before right now. So love what you're doing. So Pat, talk, talk about in, in your role as executive director of the organization, what does your day to day look like or week to week? Where do you spend your time? It's an interesting question. I, I ask myself that sometimes too, is I say, well, what did I accomplish today? Mm. And you know, it's nice if, you know, like Monday, for example, um, I applied for the um, federal assistance, the PPP grant, and we got 100, you know, I applied in the morning, and by the afternoon, there was $190,000 in our Books for Africa account. Okay, well, there you go. That's, that's something that was accomplished today. <laughs> right. But some days, you know, I'm, I'm sending emails, and it, there's a lot of, it's a lot of little things. You're sending an email, you're talking to a staff person, you're, you're, checking on a, on a project. And at the end of the day, I sometimes say, what, now what did I accomplish? I mean, really what, you know, I sent a bunch of emails, but did I accomplish anything? And so I think I, I always ask myself that question because at the end of the day, we're extremely efficient at Books for Africa. We, we have to be as a small nonprofit. So mm. it's all about making your time count. And uh, you know, that's what it takes, I think, to run a global operation. We are active in every single country in Africa. We've shipped to every country in Africa. Uh, we Just yesterday, we hit the 48 million bookmark. We sent our 48th millionth wow. book yesterday uh, to Congratulations. Kenya. Yeah, thank you. Where did so they go, uh, Pat? That container went to Kenya, wow. to Nairobi. So it's... Um, you know, an average day could be anything from applying for and receiving funding. Uh, it could be talking to members of Congress or trying to get them to talk to you. 
could be talking to our friends at Vector saying, you know, can we line up the shipment uh, and all the logistics with that, coordinating with staff, making sure we're all on the right page, or it might be someone calls a, a, a 90 year old person who's moving out of their house into an uh, apartment and they want to know if we want their 50 year old encyclopedia set. We get a lot of calls like that. Mm. Uh, the sh short answer is we really don't. <laughs> but we appreciate their thinking of us. <laughs> All right. So before I bring Enrique in, who is going to uh, have a, a few questions around the global environment, um, I'm always really curious or in challenging times what leaders, uh, some of the core elements of their leadership and, and the best practices that they, go, that they um, keep front and center. Uh, yesterday, we were talking with uh, a member of the MedShare team, and he, he spoke about the power of focus, right, during these challenging times. If there's one thing, uh, Pat, that, that you really relied on uh, for effective and successful leadership, especially in challenging times, what would that be? I hate to say it, but it, it's common sense on some level. I, I think it's, it's efficiency. You know, and everyone brings different things to the table. Um, some people bring, you know, tremendous analytical skills. Some people have great communication skills. Um, for me, what 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 I like to focus on and and bring to the table, and or try to bring to the table, is we're all about efficiency. How do we send the most books uh, most efficiently and effectively for the lowest cost? because then we can stretch those dollars uh, further. Um, I think there's also a sort of a, a PR benefit or, or visibility or a charisma element. I was once, um, I remember my wife once uh, was w working on this master's program in international and on nonprofit management. And she brought me in as a speaker to the class. And I had just been hired at Books for Africa. And so I came in to speak to her class on on uh, nonprofit management, and they were all studying to have a job like I have had, and it dawned on them that I had really no experience in international nonprofit management at all, and they were sort of shocked and appalled <laughs> that someone without training could run an organization like Books for Africa, and I remember the instructor of the class said, you know, Training is important, but it's not everything. Occasionally, a charismatic leader will come forward and they will run an organization and they're able to do it. And so training is important, but there are uh, other elements that can also uh, bring to, you know, bring themselves forward. So I always like to, based on that, I always, I, I like that. I always like to think of myself as the charismatic leader. Hopefully that's true. Um, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of others would disagree with that, but uh, no, maybe it's an excuse for, <laughs> for incompetence. I don't know. <laughs> I think you're getting a vote of confidence from Adrian. If I, uh, is yeah. that right, Adrian? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I've, I've dealt uh, firsthand with, with Pat and uh, his enthusiasm and, uh, and just willingness to get involved is, is, is always front and foremost. So it's, mm. it's always been a pleasure, yeah. Well, and I think if I may add a couple of things to that, um, just if you don't judge uh, Pat's leadership by what he's saying, but what kind of team that he has, I mean, they're amazing. They're super nice. They're very professional, very hardworking. All the warehouses, all the people that I have had the opportunity and the pleasure to interact with, they're, they're just not only like efficient and hardworking and committed, but they're just good people. They're fun to hang around. They go and play instruments, and it's fun to go grab a beer with them, and it's I think you have a really good team, Pat. So I think that actually speaks uh, speaks very clearly to the kind of leader that that you are, probably. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna just hop in there. Uh, mm. I, I agree. I, I always think of it like every year, because we're gonna have this year our best year ever. We'll send more books this year and raise more money than ever before. It, to me, that's like winning the Super Bowl. When you have a record year, it's like winning the Super Bowl. And so to go to a sports metaphor, I always want to keep the team together to, to compete again next yeah. year. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's a great team. Uh, a lot of the folks on there have been with us a, a long time, and there's no substitute for, you know, someone who's uh, 
personable that some people who are liked by other people and people who are competent and committed. Mm. Well, you know, clearly, I mean, you what, just, I'm sorry, go ahead, Adrian. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just saying, uh, James in the Atlanta warehouse, Pat, I mean, he's such a, he's so enthusiastic and he leads the volunteers there and uh, he's just such a minefield of information that it's, it's such an introduction, it's such a, a fantastic introduction to Books for Africa, if, if that's a person. Uh, um, uh, first uh, knowledge of them that uh, he, is, he, is, he is really he is really his, his enthusiasm is contagious you know absolutely well clearly to, to, to ship your 48th millionth book uh, and, and <laughs> you know that that is that is really doing something and as much as I love the intangibles that both Enrique and Adrian have shared about you Pat and your team and your culture I mean that that's that's what we call GSD getting stuff done. <laughs> yeah, that's so important. Yeah. Um, all right, so Enrique, um, I think this is a great uh, segue here. I know you've got some some uh, broader questions for Pat. Yeah, no, just in general, I mean, we're clearly facing a, a very tough challenge as, as a community, as, as a country, as, as just citizens of this planet, basically. And and running a, a, an organization like yours, Pat, in the middle of what's going on and knowing that it's probably the virus going to be affecting Latin America and Africa next, how, how are you, I mean, what, what kind of information are you kind of like keeping track of? How, how do you manage your team now that you rely a lot on volunteers and one of the things that you can't possibly do is probably come together and gather team and inspire them the way that you used to because of all the social distancing rules and, and what we need to do to keep everyone safe. So how, how is someone like you and an organization like yours that relies so heavily on inspiring people on the ground and face to face kind of cope with what's going on and what, what can you just tell us about, about your team around that? Well, um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the challenges with this coronavirus uh, situation, um, you know, are, are just many, and probably they're multiplied because we're a global organization, and and you know things are closed down on a community level, let alone on a global level. So, yeah, we in Atlanta normally we have about eleven to thirteen thousand volunteers every year helping pack the books. Right now, zero volunteers. No one can come in there because of the social distancing and, and the state home orders. So we don't have the volunteers. Books, normally we have books piled up all over the place uh, in our warehouses. With the schools closed, uh, books have been reduced to a trickle. Uh, right. Fundraiser, we were supposed to have the ambassador from Ghana. And I know Vector, uh, you just sent a container to Ghana uh, recently and know the ambassador. He was gonna come next week for an event can't have that event, can't have 300 donors in the room at the same time. Uh, ports in Africa closed down. So even if we can get books out the door, will they be able to be received in uh, Kenya or Dakar or, or uh, Cape Town? Um, don't know. It might change. It may be open today and closed when the books land. Uh, so all of those things are challenges. I think how we deal with it is we we don't give up and say, well, I guess we can't do anything. We'll just have to wait. Uh, is, uh, no, there are things that we can do. And so we did send yesterday our 48th millionth book. Uh, you know, we are continuing to sort books. Not as much as previously, but we're readying shipments um, for when the, the ports open up and we can send books. Um, that might be right. June or, or whatever. So. You know, I think we have to just say, well, how, how do we most effectively use the resource of the time and the staff that we have uh, to, to maximize our impact given the current situation? So we can't be, we can't operate at 100% efficiency, but we can operate at 50% efficiency. And so I'd say, you know, we, we take what we can get. I've always been a firm believer in taking what you can get and it, it's sort of a half loaf approach. And uh, our goal is to send by the end of this year our 50 millionth book to Africa. Mm. And I think we will probably achieve that. Wow, I love that's that. Great. That's great. Yeah, that's incredibly ins inspirational for, for so many other com companies out there and, and, and organizations like yours. Um, so in, in terms of 
other programs or, or if you want to use or leverage Scott's platform and, and his followers or just listeners, I guess is probably the better word, um, what, what kind of things can we do uh, as, as people that admire what you guys are doing, people that are committed to helping others and making a positive impact in the world? Is there anything that, because it seems that so many things are shot down or, or, or struggling, is there something that you are asking um, people that follow Books for Africa to, to do right now? Is there something that we can do to help out in, in right now? Again, I, I would say in life we take what we can get. So this is a, a horrible situation. So what's really difficult to do at this point in time as a nonprofit is to raise funds. It's not the right time to ask people for large amounts of money. Now we, we can ask people for small amounts of money. Uh, we can talk to our partners. So, but, but that's kind of out. And so you, you have to, I think, say, well, okay, what can we do? Well, what we can do is tell our story. So last week in Atlanta, for example, we got coverage in the Atlanta uh, Journal-Constitution, the largest newspaper in Atlanta, talking about books for Africa and our work in sending medical books to Africa. We also got coverage on the uh, TV uh, in Atlanta. Uh, can't remember the station, uh, but uh, you know, uh, also talking about our, our work and, and t connected to the coronavirus situation and how we're continuing to do what we can in spite of coronavirus. So that visibility is very important and that's something that can be done and it's an opportunity to tell your story. So I think, um, you know, we did get a large grant from Merck and it's, it's an opportunity to talk about that. So there are things you can do, there are things you can't do. For us, a lot of our work is preparing shipments in our warehouse so that when the the coronavirus ends we're, we're ready to go so i would just encourage listeners to to look at it from the standpoint of not well we what you know we can't do anything so we're just gonna have to wait there are certain things that you can do and you want to do you don't want to waste your time you don't want to create busy work but there are things that can and should be done, and so that's the way we look at it. Here, here might be a, it might be a simple-minded question. I'm, I'm good at those, uh, Pat. Um, what you were talking earlier about the books in demand, right? And, and, and the demand that's fueling, you know, soon to be 50 million books by the end of 2020. What types of books um, do you find move the fastest and are most in demand? So if we, if if any of our listeners wanted to, you know, send books your way. What, what types of books would those be? Well, uh, Scott, it is a supply and demand situation. We, there's demand for almost all kinds of books at some level in Africa, but some books are much more in demand than others, and then some books are much more in supply than others. So, for example, there's huge demand for things like a simple algebra book, but also we have a pretty good supply of that. What we really need uh, where there's demand and, and not enough supply is things like university books, especially engineering books, let's say, or, um, you know, let's say uh, medical books or uh, it's things at, at that university level uh, in some uh, specific topics. Books that are very expensive in the United States are, are very expensive in Africa also and, and more so less accessible because there's less money to buy such books. Uh, so I, everybody's always, you know, if I had a container load 20 tons of engineering books, I could have somebody, you know, 10 people would want those. They're always looking for that kind of book. Technical books, business books, uh, and uh, uh, books about IT that are current. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are, are in demand. Um, that said, you know, a lot of demand for children's books too. We get a lot of them and we, we send a lot of them. Um, that's very helpful. Um, well, one have... bit of demand, uh, and uh, this is just a, you know, this is something that not necessarily the, the listeners can provide, but we also provide books in local languages. So we are um, doing an order, hopefully here in the next couple of weeks to print a bunch of French books. They'll be printed in Hong Kong and then they will be shipped, we think, to Cameroon 
and uh, Vector will help us with that. Uh, and so that's a, a, you know, sometimes it's very specific. It's about getting people what they want. Uh, one other interesting story, and I know Vector is going to help us move these, is uh, back to Ghana. The former United Nations Secretary General, Kofi Annan, uh, is, has been a longtime friend of Books for Africa. He passed away, and his uh, personal library uh, is going to be sent to Cape Coast uh, area of Ghana, where Kofi Annan went to high school. And so we're going to be sending that. So sometimes it's very, very specific things, too. Uh, but it's all about getting people what they want, I think. Agreed. And, and uh, what I'm hearing you say is, is a lot of get, getting them the information they need to make themselves better and make their communities better, make their businesses better, or, or give them entrepreneurial ideas, maybe. Um, love the good work that you are doing. Um, all right. So... Enrique, any, before we kind of shift gears and make sure that um, our listeners know how to get in touch with Pat and Books for Africa, anything else on your end? Questions to Patrick or just yes, things that yes. we're... Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to circle back because no, Vector's I, got some news on, on some of their projects. Right. No, uh, I mean, just one thing that I would add is um, just thanking Patrick. We've, we've had the pleasure of working with him and his company for many years now. We've established a good friendship and just really, uh, I've said this to him before in person and, and it's just a, a pleasure to work with companies like him, uh, his and organizations like, like what they have, they have uh, at Books for Africa. I think it's making our, our job in logistics a little bit more meaningful. Because at one point we go from like just shipping containers to starting to ship education or hope or or, or just happiness sometimes. And, and I see it in books. It's very, very clear. We, thanks to Patrick and, and, and his support, we're able to donate a container full of books for a party that we, um, we helped organize for children in Ghana. And, and the first thing that these children, there were like 5,000 children all over and they had soccer balls and different games and food and music and when the container arrived with the books it was just heartbreaking and incredible to see how all these children that otherwise would have done anything else just ran grabbed the book sat down and started reading and, and honestly i just it's just amazing i don't know if you you've had a chance to to see the picture scott i think i share them with you but it's just amazing it's books are still very powerful and and children love them and so what patrick's doing is very uh very inspirational so so thanks for for doing it patrick and as you mentioned it never give up <laughs> you you can't afford we can't afford for you to give up so keep going yeah thanks enrique and uh, maybe i just as as enrique say vector has uh, they are our premier shipper working with vector over the last i don't know five years or whatever it's been uh Books for Africa and Vector together, we've sent millions and millions of books to to Africa, to, to many countries. We send books to some 30 countries in any given year. And so it's been a good partnership. It's been a good relationship. And uh, we we uh, value it and, and appreciate the philanthropic spirit also of, of our friends at Vector. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you for saying that, Pat. Yeah, we appreciate it. Likewise. Mm. We've seen it you know, in our collaboration going back uh, over a year with the Vector team. We've seen it firsthand, and, and we talk a lot about uh, our disdain for lip service leadership, and um, there's none of that here. It seems like on, on this whole line here, there's, there's no lip service leadership, all about action and getting stuff done. So, okay, so Pat, let's make sure our listeners know how to connect with you as well as um, learn more about Books for Africa. What, what's the easiest way for that to happen? The easiest way to be in touch with Books for Africa is to go to our website, which is books www.booksforafrica.org. And um, there's a lot of information there. You can donate. You can organize a shipment of books to Africa. If you're in Africa, you can go there and uh, see how to order a container of books from Books for Africa. And, and um, then we start talking about fundraising after that. So the website is sort of the clearinghouse. Uh, as far as social media, I'd also encourage folks to uh, to go to our uh, 
Facebook page, we put a lot of the latest and greatest information, success stories from Africa and whatnot on Facebook. So check us out on the web and on Facebook. Outstanding. And we'll, to our listeners, we'll, we'll feature as many of those links as possible on the show notes of this episode. So, uh, Patrick, really appreciate you joining us today. Love what you're doing. Love what the team is doing and have, has done for so many years. And we'll have to have you back on later this year and, and get an update on that 50 million book goal. Absolutely. And, Vector, uh, get ready, guys. You're going to send that 50 million book, and it's going to Ghana. And the ambassador from Ghana will be, um, it's going to go in a container that um, is going to be sent to the, uh, in honor of the Ghana's ambassador to the U.S. visiting both Atlanta and Minnesota. And so we're going to put that 50 millionth book in a container. It's going to go to Ghana and uh, uh, Vector, uh, get ready for that. You guys are going to be sending. Looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, we look forward to that, and that'll be that'll be definitely a huge milestone. We'll definitely celebrate with you guys and your achievements, and uh, and uh, also Patrick, we we're gonna have to get ready for the party in Ghana this year, after hopefully the coronavirus, uh, after we're all behind that, uh, we want to ship another container, so we'll definitely need your help on that as well. Uh, awesome. In December this year. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Definitely, definitely. So much, uh, a lot of brighter days lie ahead and, and look forward to celebrating these goals with, with both of you and your organizations. Okay, so uh, Pat, don't go anywhere. We appreciate your time here today. Really enjoyed your perspective, uh, both personally and professionally, and we look forward to reconnecting soon. But here as we start to wrap up today's episode, I want to bring Adrian back in with Vector. You know, uh, Adrian Vector is involved in, in a variety of fronts, um, and, and, and some of it's related to, to COVID-19 and, and our efforts there. Others, you know, Vector's been involved in a lot of philanthropic uh, initiatives for a number of years. Give us a quick update on a project or two that our listeners should know about. Well, uh, in, in uh, uh, two spirit of, of Vector's heart in, in giving back and making a difference uh, in the world, and, and we've just talked about that, and it's been mentioned on, on uh, other shows of yours, Scott, as well. Um, we started really deep diving into the world of, of uh, bringing in personal protective equipment uh, into the USA and, and, and uh, into, into uh, Mexico and even into, into Europe as well from, from China. Uh, many, many weeks ago when we realized uh, how bad this was going to get, uh, rather than sit on the sidelines and, and watch things happening. Uh, as Pat uh, said earlier, there are things that can be done now, and so we jumped uh, feet first, head first into, uh, into this world and, and, and uh, tried to see how we could best make a difference. So we actually started a COVID-19 task force, and uh, one of my colleagues is uh, responsible for uh, sorting and, and uh, procuring uh, the equipment and, and getting pricing on it. Uh, we work very, very closely with our partner Ever OK Group in, in China. Uh, we've got a long-standing relationship with them. Um, and and some of the projects uh, we, we, we're doing now, we're currently we have a charter coming out from uh, China departing on, on Monday. Um, I personally am working uh, with someone bringing in uh, 2 million masks for a, for a hospital in uh, Toronto. Um, and just uh, recently now, as from tomorrow, in fact, we will be uh, distributing 100,000 masks uh, to the homeless and to frontline workers through an organization that we've teamed up with uh, based in Atlanta, Love Beyond Walls, um, Terence, uh, Terence uh, Lester's company. And uh, so uh, that will be happening uh, from, from tomorrow. And uh, Terence Lester's organization is, in, is incredible. Um, they have been many years now actively involved in, in bettering the conditions uh, of, of the homeless and impoverished. Uh, um, uh, impoverished. And uh, so we, we're very, very excited to be uh, and proud to be part of that initiative uh, to help those people. So that is, uh, that is kicking off and those marks will be delivered as, as from tomorrow. So uh, we're very much uh, jumping right into this and, uh, and seeing where we, can, where we can help and how we can make a difference to a lot of people. Mm. Great point. I love, love the spirit uh, that fuels these efforts. Um, and, and, and again, the can-do, action-focused leadership. So really appreciate what Enrique, Adrian, and the whole Vector Global Logistics uh, team is up to. But you know what? Aside from all those projects, this series, Logistics with Purpose, 
uh, has brought so much inspiration. I think, you know, we're only four or five episodes in and we have a lot more stories to cover, but hearing from people like Pat and Books for Africa and, and how they're finding ways to continue the mission despite the, the uh, this challenging set of circumstances that everybody's enduring, that is that is good news. Uh, and while we don't have a picture for it, right, in, in, this, in this episode, we will soon enough. And I can't tell each of you how much what you're doing helps helps us all. So uh, on that note, I want to thank uh, Dr. Patrick Plonsky, Executive Director with Books for Africa. Not beyond social media, you can learn more at booksforafrica.org. Pat, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Scott. You bet. And, and well, we'll, thanks to Enrique and uh, Adrian also. Absolutely. Great, great friends of Books for Africa. So appreciate uh, talking to you again, and uh, we'll keep talking to you later today uh, as we arrange more <laughs> shipping logistics. Exactly, exactly. I was, I was just on the phone minutes, with Aaron, yeah. Aaron this morning, and uh, I will be again later for sure. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. And big thanks, of course, to Enrique Alvarez and Adrian Pertil, uh, both with Vector Global Logistics. Uh, gentlemen, really, really enjoy this mutual project we have here and these stories we're spotlighting, and thanks for all the good work that Vector's doing. No, thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you, kindly. Thank you, yep. Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Scott. Be able to do it. All right. Thank so you, to our audience, thanks, everyone. You bet. Uh, to our audience, uh, be sure to check out a wide variety of industry thought leadership at supplychainnowradio.com. Find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. On behalf of the entire team here, Scott Luton wishing you a successful week ahead. Stay safe, but please follow the expert advice and precautions that have been distributed. And know this, that brighter days certainly lie ahead. On that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.